Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Stephen Spector. With me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Good afternoon, Rob. Stephen, hello. And uh, with us today, I'm very excited. It's someone I met uh, a couple years back in Boise at the DevOps days in Boise, of all places, uh, Baruch Sedogorsky, which I think I said right, who's the head of developer uh, relations for JFrog. So, Baruch, welcome to the, sh- welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and and it's great to be here. But, but although Boise skip the there was this last year, I, yeah, I heard that they are back this year, and I'm I'm really looking forward. Yeah, I already have you slotted for a speaking slot, so don't worry about it. I already took care of it. Yes. <laughs> so be, real quick before we get going, and we, Rob asked lots of questions. Can you just give us a little background on yourself, so uh, our listeners kind of know uh, a little bit more about you? Yeah, so I'm uh, the, um, as you mentioned, the head of developer relations with JFrog, and uh, the whole organization consists of me um, at the moment. But I hope that will change. We're hiring. If you are into the best job in the world, which consists uh, both uh, a technical aspect, a lot of glory, shiny business traveling, and 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 what's not, sleepless nights, and all the fun with that. Uh, ping me on uh, Twitter at jbaruch. You probably see it in show notes or something. So uh, yeah, but for now, here I am doing developer advocacy and developer relations for JFrog. Um, JFrog is a company that um, helps developers get their code from idea to uh, to production faster, as fast as possible, by providing a set of universal tools. Uh, universal artifact repository, universal distribution platform, um, monitoring all the all this stuff, uh, uh, universal recursive component analysis, lots lots of fun technologies. Uh, we are into DevOps space uh, those days, and uh, yeah, living the dream. It's a lot of different pieces and parts that JFrog de- develops. Artifactory is right the one that people mo- most people are going to sort of under- know intuitively from the from history perspective. That's our uh, that's our um, more, more senior product, I would say, being around for for a while, and it's also the the mothership that the rest of the products kind of. Um, uh, surround and support a uh, universal artifact repository and uh, if you do any kind of development with any tool that has any binaries around it you probably uh, got the conclusion that you need sort of a repository so this is what we do there is a good practice of having one tool to manage them all uh, not necessarily because you have only one tool to manage, which is also true, but more importantly because you can build a reasonable metadata around the relationship between different components, and wow, so uh, that's why that's why Artifactory is successful and 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 known basically. Yeah, you know, I think everything that you're talking about revolves around a, a pipeline, or right? is that a, a fair? Statement. Absolutely. It is, it is. It's all about the pipeline and actually the promotion pipeline as a concept is about uh, moving artifacts from one uh, staging area to the next based on some kind of quality definitions once um, it passes those quality gates. And, and uh, if you break it down to the technical terms, it's about promoting the artifacts from one repository to another after conducting a set of tests or, or checks that guarantee that the quality is right, the security is right, the licensing is, is, is right, there is enough trust, et cetera, et cetera. Once all those checks are passed, you take the artifact and you promote it from one area, from one a repository to another makes a lot of sense so and we had a, a podcast we talked about pipelines a bit and the political aspects of pipelines with kong uh about two months two months ago the there's a component that you're describing though that to me sounds a little overwhelming right there's a lot of stages there's a lot of checks can you start a pipeline without building every all the all the stages and pieces right is there a good way to start building a pipeline yeah so so um 
when we were young and, and, and very passionate and enthusiastic, we used to run around and kind of, you know, yell at people. How do you even try to develop software without having an artifact repository? Yeah. This is absolutely insane and you cannot do it. And, and then we kind of came to this realization that artifact repository is one of the things that a, a, an organization need to grow into. Um, if you have a startup of three people, you can probably manage without it. I mean, you release your software, you know exactly what's going on. You have kind of pipeline that is built around CI server, Jenkins or whatever, when it will be the one uh, that uh, actually transfers artifact directly from one environment to another. And you don't have a lot of artifacts. You don't have enough, a lot of releases. You don't have a lot of collaboration or communication going on inside your organization, you probably don't need it. But um, the, the thing with binaries is that it's kind of a snowball that once it starts rolling, you know, that, that there, is, there is no limit. It's, it's absolutely insane, especially when we look at the history yeah. of the trends of, of our, um, uh, of our um, industry. Uh, every new step brings more and more binaries. Think about it, we, had, we started with, with continuous integration. Continuous integration was about, okay, let's build artifacts more frequently. So we have more artifacts. And then we have continuous deployment. Not only now we have more artifacts, it's important that we will keep track of them and won't throw them away because each and every artifact can end up in production. Right. And then um, what do we had next? Um, uh, we had um, DevOps, right? Mm -hmm. And DevOps is about, okay, um, of course it's about culture and everything, but from technical perspective, it's infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code means that now our hardware is actually software packed as artifacts. So now we add uh, we add stuff like virtual machine images and what's not, and then we hit it on top of that with Docker, which basically means, okay, now every, uh, every little change that you make in your Docker file will omit tens of weird binary artifacts that now you need to track, all the layers, and, and then on top of that, um, let's add microservices, which basically means the more artifacts we have, the better. Right, and uh, and on top of that, IoT now uh, is coming with billion of devices that need artifacts to 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 manage track and update. So so there's there's, wow, you just you just hit three big topics for us. And I, I want to drill into each one a, a little bit. Right, we have immutability, we have dependency graphs, and all the and connecting things, and then IoT and edge. Let's start with immutability because what what you just described to me is is this sort of shifting left. <laughs> right, we're starting with something very simple, right? I'm going to build a WAR file, and then I'm I'm going to hand that off to somebody. But you 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 sort of kept pulling things into the pipeline for us. Um, you know, building a full application, packaging it as a Docker file, building you know all the layers for it, ultimately to a, a machine image. And so from that perspective, you've got an artifact, which is an artifact could be any one of those things, right? It's some repeatable unit that you build and then that's your deployment your deployment token your deployment information describing we've actually shifted all of the configuration to the left is that a fair and and can you define shifting left for for us i i'm using the term but i want to make sure that that listeners understand yeah no i mean um, there there are some ambiguity into it so you go ahead and you and you describe what you actually mean in that <laughs> oh for shifting left yeah uh, so shifting, shifting. Left I'm not sure what I'm thinking is what you're thinking. So go ahead. Compare <laughs> <laughs> notes, because we we hear about like people wanting to shift left in in security. We talk about shifting deployment left. What that yep. really means is that there's there's typically these stages. Uh, deployment being sort of this master cliff, um, but you could talk about the same thing with test, um, pre prod, all all these all these different places where we we sort of hold and rebuild an environment so that we can stage it. You were talking about stages in this case. And so the idea of shifting left is that we're taking work that we traditionally did in the 
right stages, production, test, um, you know, pre-prod, mm -hmm, things mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that, and then move those further towards the developer side of this pipeline. So if it's um, a test stage, we're going to automate as much test as we can. If it's a security stage, exactly. we're going to automate as much security stage. I've been talking about immutability uh, lately, and in those cases, we actually talk about doing configuration and um, building machine images in the pipeline rather than in deployment. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Shifted, yeah. shifted to the left of where you traditionally do them. Exactly, exactly. So if we if we see this pipeline as um, as a flow from from left to right, we actually keep adding items that were on the right side towards the left side, and and that's I think just a fancy fancy way to say we need to automate as much as possible by uh, but but still keeping the trust and and the, the quality standards uh, intact that's what we are trying to to say we want our the the rest of the pipeline all the continuous delivery continuous deployment and continuous after uh, continuous update afterwards we want to bring it to the level of triviality that now we have with committing our source code to source control but there's another benefit to me from a dependency perspective because what one of the things that we don't want to do um, from an ops perspective was we don't want to be figuring out how all the pieces fit together as we're building the tower right if we can if we can do that early and make sure it all fits together and then and then store it as a unit, that's back to the artifact concept, then we've, we've effectively eliminated um, a lot of a lot of things that can go wrong during a deployment stage. Is that a fair? Yeah, absolutely. And here um, I, and here I think that the most critical part is metadata uh, because this is what glues together different parts of, of our application. So again, getting back to my rant about how many artifacts we have those days, uh, we need to learn uh, how to make sense out of them. And, and for that, we actually uh, need to understand how they relate to each other. And that's exactly the dependency story that, that, that we are talking about. I was going to ask you to be specific about metadata. What what type of metadata are you are you thinking? Well, so we need to describe um, when we are talking about dependencies. Dependencies are are one of one of those metadata aspects, right? So so for example, we want to say this uh, front end JavaScript component relates to those two microservices. One of them is the search, and the other is uh, the the analytics part, and and they. Um, make sense only when they go together. We can specify versions that actually work with each other uh, and, and, and all that uh, need to be deployed together or update, uh, updated together afterwards. So this kind of metadata, but it doesn't li it's not limited to that. So dependency and, and uh, compatibility is one of them, but also all the, all the quality checks that we spoke about all the trust support that we that we spoke about all the license and different compliance aspect that we spoke about performance metadata is also a very important part of it and and all that should be recursive because when i look at my docker image now which is eventually will be my microservice there are tons of artifacts inside it, inside the different layers that might have different aspects that all of them need to be annotated with metadata. And then, and then this metadata will be automatically processed by the pipelines and eventually searchable and queryable. I, you know, it's interesting. I, I hadn't appreciated the metadata component because you're really describing, you, you described it as a snowball. And so what you're saying is, is that as this snowball gets built up through the pipeline, you actually need to be able to introspect all of the things that went into building it, even though you can really, you only get the outside. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma as you're building up this, this artifact, you know, for what we do, it would just be the final deploy artifact, but there's a ton of things inside of that you actually need to understand. Yeah, it, there's, you can't just say, oh, here's a file, go, go deploy the file. If you really want controls, 
you have to be able to say this file maps to all of these other pieces and this build and this hashtag and this um, in, you know, incredible set of, of pieces and parts. That makes a lot of sense. The metadata, the metadata is, is basically surrounds the artifacts. So every artifact has some history and longe- some, some components. Do you see people mixing and matching artifacts in the system? Of course. I mean, it's not that I see it or not. That's the reality, right? We, okay. we do have a, 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 a truly universal and polyglot development those days when we have different components from different types being eventually merged into one system or, or one completely different technologies and, and uh, 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 package types for that matter. And, and uh, this is where universal solutions actually shine because you can have best of class uh, tools for each and every one of the technology, but it all worth nothing if you cannot tie the metadata together and build some kind of a, a a query that will make sense and give you results across all these zoo of, of different technologies. Wow. Okay. So all of these, all the different pieces and parts that build your, go into building an artifact, throw off metadata. And then what you're saying is there's, there's a, there's a sort of a, a universal plane where that information is tracked and managed and put through. Okay. Exactly. Uh, exactly. It's quite that way. I usually think of, you know, pipelines as, as relatively linear monolithic things, but you're, you're describing a pipeline that's much more composited from a whole bunch of different sources. Yeah, and, and I guess the real, uh, um, the real difference, as I mentioned, is, 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 is basically scale. Right, so when you when you write um, a, a kind of a naive application, use one technology, and then maybe even use it for deployment or or add some kind of a deployment package to it, being it Docker, Debian, um, RPM, or whatever, um, it's all manageable, right? You you don't need really to go crazy about it. But when you have um, m- complicated microservices built product with different technologies into it and you need to answer the question okay i have this component how it even got there or um what do i need to roll out to production now of 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 all this a uh, huge pile of binaries from different types that came from different directions and built with different technologies you really need to to be able to make sense across all of that and and metadata is is the only way there there is no no way around it and we actually do it with metadata regardless of the tools that we use the only question is how painful it is to first add this metadata and then use it in queries looks up lookups etc etc because okay. i saw like absolutely crazy shit when people add to their file names up to eight <laughs> different tokens that represent different parts of metadata just because our file systems are, are stupid. The only metadata that can use on the file, it's its path or, or, or its name. And people are like, well, it is what it is. Let's try to add to, to this, um, you know, to, 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 to this mechanism as much, as, as much metadata as we can. And it goes absolutely absurd. And eventually it's, it's, it's basically useless as well. But you're, you're making me think back. Uh, I have an industrial engineering background and there's always a debate over inventory part numbers for exactly this thing. They're like, all right, our inventory system isn't that great. So we're going to start making our part numbers super smart. And you end up with these crazy part numbers, um, uh, you know, with all sorts of codes and dashes and, and things like that. And so, yeah, but, but we are, we are, parts. we are lucky. Yeah. We are lucky because we have the built-in identity in every binary that we create that we can get back to, in, uh, to the inventory system. And that's, of course, uh, the, the checksum. 
right? We can take any, any sets of bytes and reduce it to a unique identifier from which we then can look up a metadata in the metadata storage, so artifactory in, the, in, in our case, and then may make sense of it. If we don't use it, this is, this is our problems and that's a pretty stupid thing to do, but at least as opposite from, from um, you know, like mechanical parts, which don't have this building identifier, we are, we are lucky to have it. That makes a lot of sense. This is, this is an aspect of, of covering, of building a, a pipeline that I think people really haven't thought through uh, in the discussions that I have, right? It's all kumbaya, I want a pipeline and dev and ops are gonna, you know, build a rainbow between them. What, what, you're, what you're really describing is that there's, in building that, that rainbow, there's a lot of pieces and parts that, that all have to fall in. And if you don't know the origin of those parts, uh, you really don't know what you built. Mm -hmm. I love these manufacturing analogies because they really help us define and that, that, defined, of course, defined the, 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 fun, the fun part about, about the mechanical analogies is when they break. <laughs> yeah. So, so we, we are in love in, uh, in this Toyota manufacturers, uh, mm -hmm. bill of material stuff, and then we have a uh, supply chain, and then we have like really all these uh, waste concepts and all that. And, and it works pretty nice. Uh, for me, it breaks when we have the delivery. Uh, so what happens when uh, someone gets the car? Uh, they get the car, they drive away, and Toyota's job is done. Next time they hear about their car is more or less never. Uh, oh, I, wait, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think that in today's world, Toyota could tell you all the parts in every car that were put together, right? They have to. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. They can do yeah. this triage, but why would they do that after they completed the delivery? So this delivery process, continuous delivery, great pipeline, everything is automated. The car comes out of the factory and Toyota's job is done. Of course, they keep all the metadata, etc. But essentially, they sold it to their uh, to their dealerships, and 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 this is the end of it. While in the, uh, in software delivery, a uh, getting first version of your application to production, it's actually just the start. Oh, but I I don't know. I think I think you've got a better analogy than you're giving it credit for. Because if there is a airbag issue, right? Toyota needs to know which cars have the defective parts in it. This would just be the same as having uh, the, you know, the heart bleed bug in your in your build infrastructure, or a you know, this or a, is true. Or a dependency but... or a dependency that that wasn't that had a security flaw. You actually need to know what things are, have that flawed component in it, so that you can rebuild and, and remedy. Yes, that I agree, and that's a good start. But a recall for an airbag is an exception is a crisis mode in uh, which Toyota does something they don't want to do, right? They have <laughs> to, and they do it. It's standard operating procedure for software. For right. software, software updates are the normal mode of operation. Mm -hmm. Customers expect us to get new functionality right after we deliver the previous version. It's like, think about it, it's like Toyota car comes out of the factory with a smaller robot inside that will be programmed to add a flying ability in six months, <laughs> um, in six months time. I, this is, so we had talked about dependency graphs a little bit. What you're describing to me is, is part of the thing that makes software awesome and horrible at the same time. Because Absolutely. We know that every, that when we build software, um, when we build, you know, use other components in that software, which if you're not doing, you're crazy. Um, those components are being updated. You want to use components that are being updated. And so as things shift around your development workflows, how do you know that it's not going to break you? How do you know that, that the new version of uh, your JSON parser isn't going to just completely upend everything else you built? Well, that, there are a couple of answers for, for, for this question. And, and that the, 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 uh, a lot of our industry 
just don't. Uh, they don't know. If, uh, it comes of different flavors of not knowing, starting from they have no idea that the company got updated because they ver they use latest version or, or version ranges, or they know that they update the components, but they had no idea what's the quality of it, or taking it one step further, they don't know if the components which are inside this component the, uh, are, are, are reliable and, and, and can be trusted. So there, there, there is a lot of, well, we are not quite sure, but that's okay, mode of operation, which brings stuff like Equifax and, and, and a lot of fun uh, to our lives. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. There are a lot of tools that allow you to answer at least some of those we don't know. So just, just a proper dependency management with proper versioning will at least prevent updating what you don't want to get updated. And uh, next step would be some kind of analysis of your dependencies for the, the things that you care and, and that could be a lot. Uh, obviously, um, the, the, the usual suspects will be check for security vulnerabilities and license compliance issues, but also stuff like signatures, performance, architectural decisions. Um, this component has a bad, uh, b b bad resume in the market and we don't want to use it or, or, or whatever. Uh, this license is generally okay, but since it's the license of our competitor, we prefer not to use it. Uh, any, any, any type of this question, and depending on how, again, how universal and sophisticated your scanner is, you can get uh, answers, more partial, less partial, complete in, the, in, in, in some cases, and then build this, build this trust. The, the problematic part is, is, of course, the false sense of security that tools which are not comprehensive enough give you when you use them and, and you see those green check boxes, but actually there is something else that's going on that those tools failed to check and, and didn't, and probably their market department uh, didn't bother to let you know that there are some checks that, that they just don't do. Yeah, I, and I think a lot of people writing software don't think through the level of depth that you're describing. Um, oh no, absolutely. Again, this is kind of stuff that you need to grow into. And, and, and of course, uh, pain is instructional, and that's my favorite hashtag for uh, for for a long long time now. Uh, there is nothing that educates market better than Equifax incident. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I'm sad to think that that we need things like that to learn. Um, oh, but, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there is no, there is this old Russian proverb that stupid people learn from their mistakes and smart people learn from other people's mistakes. <laughs> it's bullshit. It's bullshit. No one learns from other people's mistakes because everybody yeah. thinks they are smarter than all the rest of the people and it won't happen to them. And pain is instructional is the only way to go. I, we, we have a tendency in the software industry to think that we, we can always build something in a weekend better than a team has spent years building. Well, I would, I would speculate that otherwise there would be no software development at all. <laughs> I, 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 I think that there's some challenges that are, that are deep challenges. And, and along those lines, I, I would pivot us, this conversation a little bit to edge because there's, there's, a triangle that we're, we're sort of building in this conversation, or at least I'm trying to build in this conversation, right? We've talked about dependency graphs, we've talked about artifacts and pipelines, um, and, and now we're talking about hard problems. You know, when we talk about uh, distributed programming, distributed topologies, all of a sudden, the, all of those things we just named become you know, much more critical, much more sensitive to building an application that you've deployed across thousands of data centers or, or hundreds of thousands of, of IoT endpoints is have you been have you been you know, thinking about what that that new environment looks like from a, a software pipeline perspective? 
Oh yes, absolutely, and and I think I I, um, I mentioned it uh, when we spoke about this age of binaries that uh, indeed IoT is is the next frontier. Um, we we already start to get the beginning of this wave, uh, and and we see a completely new um, scale of challenges when we speak about software update of uh, IoT devices, of, of, of the edges. Um, and um, so, for example, just uh, one of my favorite examples by far happened actually to me a year ago. Um, I was in a conference and my wife called me and, and, and she said, I came home and the kids are sitting in the dark. And um, I'm like, um, what's going on? Do we have like a, a, a electricity blackout? And she's like, no, the internet is down. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the kids, they, they didn't realize that they can actually use the, the, the switch on the wall to turn the lights on. Because they're like, Alexa, turn the lights on. It doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work. We'll sit here in the dark. Um, and 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 this is this is where where we where we are. And uh, related to that, um, Google uh, Wi-Fi had an, an legendary for me uh, uh, incident when they managed uh, with the bad software update to reset um, some some of their routers. And and this is an, a problem that cannot be easily solved because they cannot revert their update because their routers are already disconnected. They cannot um, push another update that will fix it because their routers are already being disconnected. And, and, and what do you do? Those types of, of, of challenges we never had. So instead, they sent an email apologizing and asking to reconfigure the routers again to connect to the to, to the network and everything. But but this is this is um, those signs are that something big unknown that we don't necessarily know how to deal with with is coming. And and you, we here in you, JFrog, yeah. Yeah, I uh, know. Go finish your sentence. I'll ask the question. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that we, we in JFrog uh, think about it because for us, it's, it's, it's the matter of pipelines of binaries. Now, going not to your data center, but all the way to your device or all the way to your edge server or the gateway and, and, and how, um, what, what can you do, what can you do here? And uh, the concept that we kind of uh, thinking about is called continuous update. And that is the next step after continuous delivery and continuous deployment uh, to ensure that things like uh, that I described that happened to Google won't happen anymore because we will, uh, uh, first of all, be sure in the updates that the, we push to our, to our devices. And on top of that, we'll know exactly how to recover to situations like that. And uh, it's kind of hard to explain. And uh, we wrote a book about it. Um, we're going to um, present it in uh, our user conference uh, in, uh, swamp up in in, in uh, May uh, in Napa, uh, and and it's all about that. It's all about the next frontier that we have in pushing binaries to the devices that should, they should go to. No, that makes sense. And so, would that include like an A/B test or some way to say you know actually stop a rollout and process if it looked like it was failing? I mean that that to me is the there's a certain inevitability to have taking getting bad updates. The, the only thing you can really do is mitigate the extent to which people suffer. Yeah. Uh, well, um, if you if you build a pipeline that you can trust, um, bad updates will eventually be as rare as the recall for airbags. Going back to our, our <laughs> That's not a good analogy. analogy. That's <laughs> um, the real world is, is messy. Uh, you know, the, a lot of these pipelines are relatively pristine. You want them to be very reliable. Do you yep. inject chaos into the pipelines to make more the more real world? Um, oh no! I, oh, absolutely yes. One of the one of the aspects of building trust in your software is building trust in your pipeline, and and building trust in your pipeline is all about determining those weak links. And, and trying to break 
your um, your quality gates and see if something comes through that, that shouldn't come through. And of course, the tools that consist of the pipeline should be reliable as well. And this is, by the way, one of the reasons why uh, one of the most important features, according to our users of our, our tools, is actually their high, uh, high availability. Um, so Artifactory has availability for a high availability for for a while now, be, just because of this reason that our customers trust their pipeline um, that takes their software to production uh, to our tools. And uh, one of the most important uh, feature requests that we had for a while with Jeffrog X-Ray is having high availability, and we released it just recently and made a lot of of customers that understand how the pipeline tooling is important, very, very happy about that as well. So what, what you're saying here is that if you know, you're creating a deployment pipeline, the pipeline becomes a critical resource. So you have to have, make it highly available because it's, it, if, you're, if you have an issue or a vulnerability or you detect something, you need that system to work. It has to be able to roll, roll out a new update um, uh, exactly. Uh, and, and that's exactly that. What we see now with vulnerabilities like Spectre that was discovered, uh, what, like a couple of months ago, um, is that unlike other type of, types of vulnerability for which you can uh, be protected by using certain software or, or, or patching um, in a certain way, way Spectre-based attacks cannot be discovered before they are deployed. Right. We can go into that, it will take us another how, uh, hour to explain <laughs> why, uh, but the whole idea of, uh, uh, of, of spectre-based attacks is that they take a perfectly valid code and abuse it to uh, read from protected areas in, in memory. So after one uh, attack, this code can be then flagged as potentially vulnerable and, and, and replaced, but it's only a matter of time until a next, um, they're called, um, um, I think. Zero day? Uh, no, no, I, yeah, but that's basically the zero day attack. I tried to call how they call it, these pieces in, in, in the code that they attack. It's not widgets. It's gadgets. Oh, widget gadget. Yeah. So, so there are uh, when they uh, when they find a certain pattern in code, which is called gadget for some reason, um, and they target it for a spectre attack. The day before, no one knew to look for this code. So we are talking, as with any zero uh, zero day vulnerability attack, to uh, the, the only remedy is to patch the systems as as fast as possible. And now you have all your pipeline. Um, and and you, you, you wrote this update, you learned about it, you wrote this update, you have your software that need to be pushed to whatever device, uh, servers, desktop computers, mobile devices, IoT devices, and your pipeline is down. I, what, I, what I really like about the way you're describing this, and you know, it, it, it's, it's we, we live in a world that's merging very quickly into a continuous delivery environment. Right? If you, you don't have, you don't see your, your life is continuously deployed, your, your software life is continuously <laughs> deployed, then, then, you know, to me, you're, you're, you're vulnerable to a lot of different problems. And, and I like that people are starting to make real investments in, in, a, in an infrastructure that's not just about installing something, but keeping it updated, these day two scenarios. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of work and talk we've done um, in other podcasts about immutability and the, you know, and deploying an artifact so that you're not trying to build things on the fly and, and dealing with that type of variation too. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, I, I, the way you're describing the world to me sounds like this, you know, it, it's really this constant flow of new pieces and parts, and then in a flow, you have to know where they're you know, the providence of all the units. Um, that's that's the that's the liquid software. This is exactly the new reality that we we are going to find ourselves in very very soon. When you actually have a constant flow of software 
from uh, from coding all the way to to the devices and and the the hard part is make sense of what's going on absolutely so barack i have returned to the podcast and uh rob and i did a podcast last week where we actually saw each other so i didn't get the usual uh so he could actually look at me and give me the nasty look and tell me i have to wrap up i'm the timekeeper so uh i apologize for breaking in but i wanted to thank you again for uh coming on the podcast if uh folks wanted to reach out to you what's the best way twitter or where yeah so twitter of course is the is the tool of choice i'm at j baruch on twitter um both publicly and privately my dms are open if someone wants to discuss something or take it you know to email or whatever uh, and and yeah I'm looking forward for tons of new followers thanks to the f your famous podcast obviously and uh, thank you again for having me that that was a lot of fun great thanks again